Twenty years ago, it appeared for a moment that all of our energy problems could be solved. It was the announcement of cold fusion, nuclear energy like that which powers the sun, but at room temperature on a tabletop. It promised to be cheap, limitless, and clean. Cold fusion would end our dependence on the Middle East and stop those greenhouse gases blamed for global warming. It would change everything. But then, just as quickly as it was announced, it was discredited so thoroughly that cold fusion became a catchphrase for junk science. Well, a funny thing happened on the way to oblivion. For many scientists today, cold fusion is hot again. We can wield the power of nuclear physics on a tabletop. The potential is unlimited. That is the most powerful energy source known to man. Michael McCubrey says he has seen that energy more than 50 times in cold fusion experiments he's doing at SRI International, a respected California lab that does extensive work for the government. McCubrey is an electrochemist who imagines in 20 years the creation of a clean nuclear battery. For example, a laptop would come pre-charged with all of the energy that you would ever intend to use. You're and are decoupled from your charger and, and, and the wall socket. Automobiles? Same. Potential is for an energy source that would run your car for three, four years, for example, and you take it in for servicing every four years and they'd give you a new power supply. Power stations? You can imagine a one-for-one -one plug-in replacement for nuclear fuel rods. And the difference only would be that at the end of the lifetime of that fuel rod, you didn't have radioactive waste that needed to be disposed of. McCubrey showed us just how simple the experiment looks. There are only three main ingredients. First, palladium, a metal in the platinum family. Second, a kind of hydrogen called deuterium, which is found in seawater. Deuterium is essentially unlimited. There is ten times as much energy in a gallon of seawater from the deuterium contained within it and there isn't a gallon of gasoline. The palladium is placed in water containing deuterium, and the third ingredient is an electric current. So the experiment's running inside this box. That's correct. Can we open it up? We can look inside. There's, there's, there's very little to see. The experiment is wrapped in insulation and instruments. They're looking for what they call excess heat. In other words, is more energy coming out than the electric current puts in? No one knows exactly how excess heat would be generated in the experiment, but McCubrey shows us what he thinks is happening. This is an artist's rendition of uh, deuterium atoms. At the atomic level, palladium looks like a lattice, and the electricity drives the deuterium to the palladium. They sit on the surface and they pop inside the lattice. McCubrey believes there is a nuclear reaction, possibly a fusion process like what happens in the sun, but occurring inside the metal at a slower rate and without dangerous radiation. What we're trying to do is Scientists today like to call it a nuclear effect rather than cold fusion. At least 20 labs working independently have published reports of excess heat, heat up to 25 times greater than the electricity going in. This little piece of palladium metal has about a third as much energy as the battery in your automobile. So very small volumes, very small masses can produce large amounts of energy. McCubrey has been working on this since that first discredited claim of cold fusion made headlines 20 years ago. We devised an experiment. Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons amazed the world in 1989 with their cold fusion news conference at the University of Utah. Fleischmann in particular was one of the world's leading electrochemists and the announcement of room temperature fusion set the world on fire. We have found the conditions where fusion takes place. Immediately, prestigious labs at MIT and Caltech rushed to reproduce the experiment, but they didn't get the same results as Fleischmann and Pons. We have no evidence in our laboratory with any of our samples for fusion. The careers of Fleischmann and Pons were destroyed quick as a nuclear flash. We worked for five years on this. Names once linked to a Nobel Prize were forgotten by nearly everyone, and most of the scientific world today is happy to leave it that way. I'm still waiting for the water heaters. I'm still waiting 
for the thing that will produce heat on demand. Richard Garwin is one of the most respected physicists in the world and has been since the 1950s when he helped design the most successful fusion experiment of all time. The hydrogen bomb, sort of the ultimate in hot fusion. Yes, it was uh, unfortunately a very successful experiment. This experiment... Has Garwin was a critic of Martin Fleischmann back in 1989, and he has seen the reports on the research that has been done since. You think Macubre is mistaken? Yes. After all the work that he's done? Yes, I think so. Why? I think probably he measures the input power wrong. It's one of the most common criticisms of cold fusion experiments that the amount of electricity going in and the heat coming out are simply mismeasured. It's possible, it is possible that I have been mismeasuring energy for, for 20 years, but I think it's extremely unlikely. A very large number of people have been making these measurements and measurement of current voltage temperature resistance they're some of the simplest measurements that a physicist or physical scientist will measure. But there's another problem that critics point out. The experiments produce excess heat at best 70% of the time. It can take days or weeks for the excess heat to show up, and it's never the same amount of energy twice. I require that you be able to make one of these things, replicate it, put it here, it heats up the cup of tea, I'll drink the tea, then you make me another cup of tea, and I'll drink that too. That's not it. For you to be a believer, it has to work 100% of the time. Uh, pretty much. Our critics often complain that we can't boil water to make tea. We could have, in fact, boiled 64 gallons of water and made 1,000 cups of tea had we chosen to do so. No one's sure why the experiments can't be consistently reproduced. McCoubrey thinks it has something to do with how the palladium is prepared.